Well, good morning. My name is Alan Benson, and I'd invite you to please open your Bibles to Romans chapter 12, and we're going to deal with verses 9 to 16, so follow along with me as I read. It is page number 1762 in the Blue Bible. Romans 12, 9 through 16. <clears throat> Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. <clears throat> Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Benson. Well, as we dig into God's Word this morning, I actually want to start and let you know a little something about me that you may not know. Um, when I was a kid... My, and then into my early teens, I was a, a sports card collector. And in fact, just not that terribly long ago, I got it in my head to dig out all of my old sports card collection uh, from our basement. It had been sitting down there since we moved in and uh, was reminded that I still have thousands of early 80s and early 90s uh, football, baseball, and basketball cards from way back when I was a kid and an early teen. Now, going through those, unfortunately, I didn't come up with very many that actually held any monetary value, nothing of, of substance, but I was reminded as I went back through them that there was always one card in particular that really held the, the pride of place in my collection. It's my 1983 Tops Kent Herbeck card, number 690. Now, I know a lot of you probably remember old Kent Herbeck from, from the Twins, right? But here's the strange thing. I grew up in Ohio, and uh, fortunately, though, I, my parents and grandparents are Minnesotans, and so I was the odd kid in central Ohio that was a huge Minnesota Twins fan didn't hurt that they won two World Series during that time as well. But Kent Herbeck was my uh, favorite ball player. And so back in those days, I got it in my head one year that I think I'm going to write him a letter. And so I wrote Kent Herbeck a letter, and I asked him for an autograph. In fact, I asked him if he would autograph one of my baseball cards. And so kind of in faith, I decided, well, I'm going to put this in the mail uh, stick it in with a self-addressed stamped envelope and then just wait and see if he'll reply, see if he'll send it back, send it back with his signature. And you know what happened? He sent it back. He signed it. There's a picture of it right there. This is my autographed 1983 Tops Kent Herbeck card number 690. It's pretty precious to me. This card was signed by the first baseman, the Twins legend himself. At least I think that's his autograph. <laughs> you see, I wasn't there, right? It just came in the mail. I'd like to believe that Mr. Herbeck actually took the time to read my letter. He took the time to autograph my card, stick it back in the mail. But of course, I cannot be sure. Unless I decide I'm going to take this card to a professional who will 
authenticate it for me, which would cost me some money, uh, verify that it's actually his signature, I have to sort of go on faith and accept the fact that either this is real or it's a fake, right? Now, before we jump into Romans chapter 12, that's where we are in our sermon series, uh, Romans 12, the, the passage that Mr. Benson just read for us, I actually would invite you to open your Bible to the Gospel of John as we get started. John chapter 13 in particular, and we're going to look real quick at verses 34 and 35. So John chapter 13, 34 and 35. In the context, these verses actually appear in a series of sayings Jesus is teaching to his disciples on the night that actually led up to his crucifixion. And Jesus met with his disciples that night and he told him this. He said, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, you can see there in those chapters that Jesus said a whole lot more than just those two verses that night. But what he spoke in those two verses is extremely significant. I mean, first, just looking at it, Jesus is giving his followers a very clear command. He says, love one another. In fact, that was so important that he repeats it three times in those two verses. He tells his disciples that he expects them to love one another. But notice in addition in those two verses that Jesus speaks also about what's going to happen if his followers commit to loving one another. He said what would result then is that everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. In other words, the distinguishing mark of a disciple is love for one another. That's the context in which we uh, come to uh, in Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 16. It, too, is a passage all about love. But it's much more than a text that helps us to define what love is. It actually is a passage that's, that's here in this place in Paul's letter to help us discern what love looks like. In particular, this passage, it picks up on Jesus' command and it answers this question. How will we know when deeply devoted followers of Jesus are becoming more and more like Jesus? We'll know by their love. Genuine Father glorifying Christ abiding spirit formed Love for one another. And we know this is Paul's primary focus in this section of the letter because of the way he begins this passage. I hope you do have a Bible open to Romans 12. And I want you to look with me right now at verse 9. Where he begins this. And he says that love must be sincere. Love must be sincere, or if we were going to render that a little bit more literally, we would say something like, let love be without hypocrisy. Let love be sincere. Let love be without hypocrisy. You see, in the ancient world in Paul's day, that term hypocrite, or at least the root there, it could actually refer to a person that was playing a role, so we would use it in reference to an actor. Maybe some of you watched this year's Emmy Awards uh, earlier this week. You were seeing who was nominated and, and, and who won an award for acting. In Hollywood, of course, it is an honor to win an award for outstanding work as an actor. But you see, in the church, if you're known as an actor or a hypocrite, that is not a compliment. 
And Paul wants us to hear that, that love, first of all, it must never be a performance. That true love can't be faked. He wants us to see that there's a, a pseudo love that actually conforms to the pattern of this world. But there's a transformed love that flows from a redeemed heart and a renewed mind. Christ-like love must be sincere. It must be genuine. It must be without hypocrisy. So in the time that we have together this morning, I want us to consider from this passage eight characteristics of Christ-like love that are highlighted in Romans 12, verses 9 to 16. Eight characteristics. Now, that's a lot, so we're going to move rather quickly. But you'll notice, even as you scan through those verses, that these characteristics are actually listed as a series of commands. And so we could summarize it and say it this way, that those who wish to love like Christ must live like this. And those who live like this will love like Christ. Now, notice in the text as this passage gets started in verse 9, in verse nine immediately after Paul says, love must be sincere, he follows it up with these first two commands. He says, hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but when I was a kid, I was taught to use the word hate cautiously and sparingly. We were not to use hate in our house. I was never allowed, for example, to say that I hated my sister. So, you know, the smart kid that you are, the smart Alec would always say something like, well, that's fine, then I strongly dislike my sister. But when, you come to, when it comes to evil, hate really does seem to be the appropriate term to use, doesn't it? Because, of course, we should hate what is evil. You know, we hate the abuse of power. We hate racial injustice. We hate the wickedness of human trafficking. We hate suffering. We hate disease. We hate death. These are good things to hate. And there are plenty of good ways to hate what is evil. But is that all that Paul is saying here? I want you to actually think back to a couple of weeks ago when we were in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, where Paul said in that verse, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. In that passage, that word world really didn't refer to planet Earth as much as it refers to this current age that we live in. If we had a lot more time this morning, we could really work through all of the Bible and look at this contrast that's made throughout Scripture between this present age, which is sometimes called the old age, and what is to come, the, the age to come. And if we did that, really book by book throughout the Bible, we would see that this age that we live in, this current age, is consistently characterized by sin, evil, and human rebellion against God. And so when we come to this statement in Romans 12, when Paul follows the statement that love must be sincere with hate what is evil and cling to what is good, the first thing we see is that Christ-like love is countercultural. If you're following along, if you're a note taker, there's a sheet in your bulletin. You can jot some of these things down if you'd like. But the first characteristic we see in this passage is that Christ-like love is countercultural. The kind of love that is characteristic of the age to come is not characteristic of this present evil age. And the problem is, or the challenge, 
is that even as those who are raised in Christ and thus belong to his kingdom, we still work and go to school and raise our families and try to live out our Christian faith in a present evil age. Now, we as Christians don't belong to this age anymore, but it still surrounds us. And so, therefore, to love like Christ is to love in such a way that is profoundly countercultural. Just because they will know we are Christians by our love doesn't necessarily mean that the world will define love the way that Jesus does. You see, Christ's love is countercultural. Now, the second thing we see as we move on in this passage in verse 10 is that we are to be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Now, in order for us to unpack that verse together, I want us to first uh, put on our philosopher's hats this morning. I want you to ponder a philosophical question with me. I don't know if you're expecting to do some philosophy at uh, 1045 in the morning or whatever uh, on a Sunday morning. The question is this, if God is eternal, what was God doing before he created the world? What was God doing before anything else existed? Now, if we turned to Genesis 1 and we tried to figure that out, unfortunately, we wouldn't have a lot of detail there about how God was spending his time in eternity past, if even we can talk about spending time in eternity past. But there is at least one place in Scripture that does speak about what God was doing before he created anything. You see, before God said, let there be light, in a sense, God was saying, let there be love. Now, as a good philosopher, you might ask, well, how could God love if there wasn't anybody around to love? And I'd say, exactly. That's the point. Now, listen to Jesus' words from John 17, verse 24, where Jesus says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Before the world existed, before God made anything, God loved The Father loved the Son. The Son loved the Father. And I think it's fairly safe to extrapolate and say that the Spirit loved the Father and the Son and vice versa. And the point is this, that Christ-like love is necessarily communal. What I mean by that, it is impossible to obey the command to love unless there is someone to love. So let's look back at Romans 12, verse 10. If we apply it to this text, it is impossible to be devoted to one another in love or to honor one, um, uh, one another above yourselves unless there is a one another in the picture. I think if there's one thing that we should remember from verses 3 to 8 that we looked at last week, And there's a lot of things we should remember from that passage. But if there's just one thing you took from that passage last week, I hope that it's, I need the body of Christ, and the body of Christ needs me. And the only way that that's possible, the only way that we can obey the one another's of the Bible, is in community. Christ-like love is necessarily communal. Now, it doesn't have to be a big community, which is why I love small group ministry. But it can't be just me and Jesus. Moving on, third, Paul says in verse 11 that we're to never be lacking in zeal, but to keep our spiritual fervor serving the Lord. So we look at that verse, I think it's fair to be honest and admit together, though, that there are just some people 
that are hard to love? And if you want to be real honest and confess to yourself this morning with me, some of those hard to love people might actually be sitting in this same room with us today or were sitting in the other service earlier today. We'd say, Lord, love those people because I'm not sure I can. Are there members of our church family that just exhaust all of your energy to love on them? Have you come to a place in your heart where you think, you know, it might just be better if we kept our distance? Is your tank just fresh out of zeal in this department? You see, brothers and sisters, Christ-like love cannot be complacent, according to the scriptures. If we're to love others like Christ, we can't pursue this path of least resistance. Love is going to take work. Now, love is not a work that we can conjure up within us. And that's why Paul goes on to say there in verse 11 that we're to keep our spiritual fervor. And to avoid complacency and and, and not let our love grow cold. Rather, that we're to seek the Holy Spirit who will keep our spiritual fervor good and hot. There's a word picture behind this phrase, spiritual fervor. And as I was trying to think of an illustration of what spiritual fervor means, I kept coming back to this picture of a tea kettle on a stovetop. You think about what a tea kettle does. A tea kettle by itself can't boil water. You pour water into a tea kettle, set it there, it's going to do nothing. It's going to stay at room temperature until it's heated. But when you turn that burner on and heat's applied, that kettle now does what it was designed to do. It was designed to boil water. And in our house, that water is boiled for a nice hot cup of Earl Grey tea. So let's take our temperature this morning. How hot is your spiritual fervor? Is it cold and complacent? Is it boiling over with blessing? You see, Christ-like love, especially for those who we find difficult to love isn't going to happen if our zeal is at room temperature. To love like Christ demands a spiritual fervor that boils up only when we yield to the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts. Christ-like love cannot be complacent. But notice also as we go on to verse 12 that Christ-like love leads to persistent prayer. And Paul exhorts us in this verse, verse 12, to be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. But we know from experience that nothing zaps our joy faster than suffering and affliction. Nothing fuels our hope and empowers our perseverance more than meditating on God's love for us in Jesus Christ. We're in Romans 12, but it's worth retracing our steps for a second. In this letter, all of this goes together. And if we go back a handful of chapters to chapter 5, we would see and be reminded that Paul said, We boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. And character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Now You may also remember back when we were working through Romans chapter 8 that Paul also said, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And as he wrote that, I don't think he's trying to minimize suffering at all. But he is trying to lead us to maximal hope. 
Because he goes on in that passage to describe how all of creation is eagerly awaiting the day when God will set everything right. And in verses 24 and 25 of Romans 8, Paul points us to our future hope where he says, For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. He goes on in the next couple of verses to say that in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. And we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Now with all that background in mind, look again at Romans 12 verse 12. And I want you to notice a very similar thread. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. You see, when we consider God's love for us and we see this Christ-like love is formed in us, we find joy and hope even in the midst of affliction and suffering. And the more we keep those things in view, the more we will want to persist in prayer. Hope, patience, prayer. Christ-like love leads to persistent prayer. Now Paul continues this rapid-fire series of commands in verse 13 and following. He says another characteristic of Christ-like love is costly. More specifically, we need to see that Christ-like love embraces costly fellowship. Now, I think I've admitted before, confessed before, that I'm not terribly crazy about the word fellowship. Not because it's not a good biblical term. It's a great biblical term. I just don't like how in modern usage we've managed to water down the meaning of the word fellowship as it's presented in the New Testament. And you may be looking at your Bible here at verse 13 and say, I don't see the word fellowship there, at least in the NIV. But what you do see there translated is this phrase, share with. To share with or to have fellowship with someone is to have some skin in the game. You see, fellowship is not merely friendship, it's a partnership. And in a partnership, each party actually invests something of value into the relationship. That's what fellowship is. And so then very similarly, in that same verse, in verse 13, Paul goes on to say that we're to practice hospitality. Now again, I, I don't mean to be really picky about translations, but I don't think that word practice is strong enough here. Because behind that word, what Paul is saying is actually that we are to pursue hospitality. To pursue something means you're going to go look for it until you find it. In fact, it's really interesting that in the very next verse, Paul uses the same word, pursue, but he gives it a negative context. He describes people who pursue Christians with evil intent. We call those people persecutors. To pursue hospitality. We'll get to verse 14 here in a minute, but I want us to think about what does it mean to fellowship with believers in need and to pursue hospitality. And I have to admit that when I got to this verse in my study this week, it was this verse that I found the most challenging and the most convicting. Because as I read these things, what I want to do is dismiss them. I want to dismiss Paul's words, push him off onto the other people in our church who have the gift of hospitality and the gift of generosity and say, that's not me, that's those people over there. Thank God for them. But you see, if, if you read this passage, Paul's words here are not addressed to a subset of Christians. They're addressed to all Christians that is, at least anyone that wants to exhibit Christ-like love. Which tells me that I need to start being prayerful about pursuing members of my church family who are in need. 
It means that I need to go looking for people to bless and looking for people to invite into fellowship in the truest sense of that word. But then if Christ-like love means embracing costly fellowship with those that I want to love, ugh, what does it mean for those who are my enemies? And Paul picks up on Jesus' teaching from the Sermon on the Mount there in verse 14. And he says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. From a biblical perspective, to bless someone means to ask God to show them his goodness and his favor. To curse just means the opposite. Now, we're going to do a deeper dive next Sunday into what it looks like to love our enemies. So I'll be brief here. But for now, let's just observe that Christ-like love is counterintuitive. It ain't normal. It's not our default setting. It's not our first move toward those who intend us harm. But we need to remember that Paul already talked about God's counterintuitive love for us in Christ. Think back to that verse in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, that says God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ, Christ-like love is counterintuitive. And yet compassion for others doesn't come natural either, does it? But Christ-like love calls us to compassion. It calls for compassion. Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. And as you reflect on these phrases here, you might think, well, let's relatively easier to mourn with those who mourn, or as the ESV puts it, to weep with those who weep. But it's a little bit more difficult to rejoice with those who rejoice because typically there's a bit of jealousy and envy that still lives within our hearts. So I thought, how do we get practical on this one? Here's how we can help one another out if we want to grow in Christ-like love. So this week, here's what I'm challenging you to do. This week, you might have an opportunity to share a prayer request with somebody. Maybe you're in a group where you share prayer requests. Usually you're sharing some kind of a need, and that's good. I hope that you do that. But if you share a need, would you follow that up by sharing a joy? And invite other people to share in that joy. Now, if you're going through a particularly difficult period of time right now, it might be actually challenging to find anything to rejoice over. But I don't want you to overthink it. I just say simply share one thing that God is doing in your life right now, even if it's in the midst of trial. And would you share that? Now, if you're on the other end of that, then when when that person shares with you something that God is doing in their life that is bringing them joy, Guess what? Would you rejoice with them? I mean, genuinely rejoice. Would you praise God with them for his grace and his goodness? Would you rejoice together over what God has done? That's one of the ways we can put that into practice. Which leads us then lastly to verse 16, where Paul invites us to live in harmony with one another, to not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position Do not be conceited. I think we could summarize this final thought by saying that Christ-like love corrects our self-perception. It's interesting when you read these passages with the passage before and after it because I think it's no coincidence that verses 9 to 16, a passage on genuine Christ-like love, it actually follows the passage that we looked at last Sunday about the body of Christ and the diversity of its members. And in fact, when you look closely here, you see that the things that Paul is saying to the church in Rome here in chapter 12 are nearly identical to the things that Paul said to the church in Corinth. 
Let me give you a snapshot from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You might recognize this illustration. That the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. The parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. It made me think of a really funny line in uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's The Fellowship of the Ring. If you think about that, or at least have seen the, the films, early on in the first book, there's a line uh, spoken by the main character, Bilbo Baggins. He's speaking to a mixed crowd of well-wishers and freeloaders at his birthday party. And he says to his group of, et- of attendees, he says, I don't know half of you, half as well as I should like. And I like less than half of you, half as well as you deserve. It's kind of an insult, but it's a funny line once you figure out what he's saying. It is a funny line, but I hope it's not descriptive of us when we gather together with our church family, when we meet together during the week. Because where there was once pride and conceit, our prayer needs to be that the Lord Jesus would correct our self-perception and that he would form in us this Christ-like love. There's a lot in these verses, isn't there? And we've covered a lot of ground here this morning. In fact, these are these eight characteristics of Christ-like love. It, it may be even a bit overwhelming to focus on it. So I think the most natural thing to do is to pray and to ask the Lord to make us more like him so that in our love for one another, everyone would indeed know that we are his disciples. And so I invite you to pray with me. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we look at this text, we look at the words of Jesus, and we bounce around the New Testament at these other examples of one another's. Lord, it is our, it is our desire to see Christ-like love formed in us. Lord Jesus, would you do that? By your Spirit, would you form that in us? That fruit of the Spirit that is love. We recognize that uh, Over a lifetime, it's going to take a lifetime to see us grow in our love. But I pray that you'd help us to do that. Father, just maybe even in one example, in one of these areas, I pray that you'd help us to to move even an inch forward this week in our Christ-like love. But ultimately, Father, we thank you for your love for us in Christ. Think about what John says in his letter that, that we loved because you first loved us. Thank you for your word and what it teaches us, and we ask that you would help us to be deeply devoted followers of Jesus who love one another. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.